Hi and welcome back. In this video I would like to uh, continue our introduction to machine learning by describing three, three general families of machine learning algorithms uh, that represent three high-level approaches towards building machine learning systems and solving the problem of machine learning. So the first class of machine learning methods is something that we have seen before in our previous video and that is called supervised learning. The example uh, that I gave earlier that is an instance of supervised learning is this example with detecting pedestrians uh, in an image that's taken by a self-driving car. The general idea of supervised learning is that we want to uh, we want our machine learning algorithm to output useful predictions or to just generally produce useful outputs on, uh, on, on a certain set of inputs. And the way that we get it to do that is by collecting a labeled data set of training examples, which are pairs of inputs and outputs. And then we train the algorithm to output these correct predictions uh, that on our on our on our on our uh, on our data set so we um, we train the model to output accurate predictions on the training data set and then when the model will see new similar data uh, data that is similar to what it has seen in its training set it will also output accurate predictions and here in this example we have labels for pedestrians and cars and if we give this computer vision systems enough of these labeled regions it will learn to output accurate um, uh, to, to make accurate uh, predictions of what is a pedestrian and what is a car on new images that it hasn't seen before um, here let's let, let's look at an let, let, let's look at another uh, example of a supervised learning data set that might be a little bit more concrete uh, housing prices in Boston so here each data point in this data set is a house and we know uh, different attributes of this um, about this house so we know its price we also know its neighborhood we know its size uh, the zip code uh, we know how many rooms it has we have a lot of additional information. So uh, I'm going to load this data set in the, using scikit-learn, which is a popular library for, for machine learning. And in Python, I can load this library, I can load its data set module, and I can learn, <clears throat> I can load this data set here into this uh, set of slides. And now using another uh, library called matplotlib, I can visualize this data set in two dimensions, and in particular, I'm going to look at uh, I'm going to look at its price, which is a function of the neighborhood education level. So here on the x-axis, I have the percentage of adults in the neighborhood that don't have a high school diploma, and so if a large if 35 in neighborhoods where 35 <coughs> percent of adults don't have a high school diploma, the price tends to be lower than in higher educated neighborhoods. And you can see this downward trend in the data just by inspecting it. So a simple supervised learning algorithm is one that would map some kind of inputs. In this case, we have our education level to certain outputs, which in this example are going to be the house, price, house prices. And what I had before was a data set of uh, of examples of X and Y, where X is the education level and Y is the house price. And we can use this as training data for our for a supervised learning algorithm that will be used to predict the prices of new houses. So here I've, I'm loading a particular algorithm from the scikit-learn library that is called Kernel Ridge. And we will see later in the course actually what is the Kernel Ridge algorithm. Uh, but for now, I am just going to load this algorithm. I will train it on this data and it learns this curve that passes through the data and that detects the relationship between the 
uh, the neighborhood education level and the house prices. And if I have access to a new neighborhood education level in the future, it will, uh, I will be able to use this curve to make new predictions. So this is a, a really simple example of, uh, of supervised learning. But this approach can be used uh, in a lot of applications. I think some of the most successful applications of machine learning today involve applications of supervised learning. And these include uh, tasks like classifying medical images or translating between pairs of languages or uh, the example that I gave earlier, which was to detect objects uh, in a self-driving car system. But supervised learning is not the only type of machine learning that we can do. Another important type of machine learning that we're going to see in this uh, class is called unsupervised learning. And here we have, an, we have a data set that doesn't have any labels, it doesn't have any human annotations, and our goal is to learn something interesting about the structure in this data. So for example, maybe we will see that this data set contains several clusters. So there are different groups of points that are more similar to each other in this data set, and it will be useful to find them. So maybe we have groups of individuals that have um, certain, certain similarities. Maybe they have uh, similar physiological measurements, which means that they have similar um, either diseases or, or the absence of diseases. Uh, and we can discover this in a just by inspecting this in visual well by inspecting the structure of the data and then this is also useful for visualizing the structure later on or maybe there are particular data points which are unusual and interesting or they're errors and we want to uh we want to, to identify those data points or another application of supervised learning is if we have some signal but it's hidden under noise but if we know that the signal has some kind of interesting structure we could try to recover it from the noise um, for example, we could try to recover human speech uh, in a noisy room or, or within a noisy phone. This is going to be a little example of what unsupervised learning uh, can do. Here I'm going to use the datasets function in the, uh, the dataset module in the scikit-learn library to, learn, to load another dataset called the iris dataset. This is a dataset of iris flowers, and for each flower we have uh, in this visualization, we have two measurements, uh, the sepal width and the sepal length. And uh, these are in centimeters. And each data point here corresponds to a flower with uh, the measurements that are specified on the x and y axis. And just looking at this data set, you already can see that it has some kind of structure. Here, these points seem to be a little bit more similar to each other than these points. Um, and an unsupervised learning algorithm can, um, can, uh, can be used to detect structure in this data. So in particular, we're going to try to learn a probability density over this data. And we're going to use an algorithm that we're also going to see in this course called uh, Gaussian mixture model. Uh, we're going to assume that uh, this data set is, will have three components, which we're going to try to learn, but we're only going to say that there are three components. And then let's see what happens if we learn this, uh, this, this, uh, this data set. So in fact, the first thing that it finds is that we have these two groups here. We have this group and we have this group. And this is something that we saw already in the data by inspecting it. And then it further says that this group breaks down into two smaller subgroups, which are given by the two red dots here. Um, and now what's interesting is that we, we actually have labels for this data set. I haven't used them, but I can now load them as well. And I can show the label of each flower using a different color. And what we see is that indeed, we have three classes in this data. And the first class corresponds to this uh, to this cluster and all these blue flowers they're actually from the same subspecies of iris flowers called iris setosa and this group of points also actually happens to have two two types of flowers which I'm denoting here in yellow and brown 
Uh, these are called Iris uh, Versicolor and Virginica. And these two are more similar to each other, but using unsupervised learning, we were able to find uh, that these two dots correspond to, to, these, to, the, um, to the centers of these two classes. And you do see that yellow flowers tend to occur more on this side of this group, and brown flowers tend to occur more on this side. And without looking at the labels, <clears throat> just by uh, just by looking at the structure of the data, we were able to identify these three groups of flowers, even though we didn't know what they were. Um, unsupervised learning also has a lot of practical applications. Uh, there are systems which are called recommendation systems. Uh, for example, the, the recommendation system for movies on Netflix, uh, some components of it or some versions of these kinds of systems can uh, be unsupervised or at least uh, more complex production systems have some unsupervised components. We can also use unsupervised learning for anomaly detection. So if certain uh, data are errors or noisy or, or if they're noise or if they are really different from their normal state, for example, a factory component that's likely to break uh, that, is, that is useful and also uh, signal denoising that I mentioned is another useful application of unsupervised learning. And finally, the last uh, class of machine learning, and this is also a really interesting approach, uh, is called reinforcement learning. In reinforcement learning, we have a slightly different uh, setup. Here, we have an agent that is acting in some environment, and this agent has some kind of internal state Based on the state, it determines to uh, take a particular action. It sends that to the environment. The environment changes in some way, and uh, and then it and then based on what happens, the state of the agent changes. And uh, as he changes a state, the agent also observes a reward of using a particular action in a particular state. And the goal of this agent is to maximize reward over time. Let me give you a slightly more specific example. Uh, imagine we have, um, uh, we have a robot that is trying to perform some kind of task, like maybe uh, um, wash, uh, wash a part of a kitchen uh, or clean part of the kitchen table. If, if the robot performs tasks that, are, uh, that, are, that involve cleaning, then the robot receives a reward. We say, hey, good robot. Uh, and, uh, and then if, if the robot does something unrelated, if it <clears throat> breaks a, a glass, then we give it a negative reward and we say, bad robot, stop. So agents and algorithms that learn from, this kind, from these kinds of rewards are uh, called reinforcement learning agents. And this is the third approach towards machine learning that I'm going to describe. Uh, this approach also has a lot of practical applications. Uh, for example, agents that play board games like chess or Go, uh, state-of-the-art agents are built using reinforcement learning. Uh, and reinforcement learning also has a lot of uh, practical applications in industry. For example, cooling systems for data centers. Uh, we can use reinforcement learning to uh, design policies for when to turn on or when to turn off cooling uh, in order to keep the data center at optimal performance and without incurring too many, in, without incurring too much cost. Um, so so uh, reinforcement learning has a lot of practical applications. And I also want to highlight this is a little bit different from regular supervised learning uh, because of this reward structure, but also because of these states. And often in reinforcement learning, an agent must um, so there are often some locally optimum optimal decisions that give it immediate rewards, but then they enter a state with uh, with bad rewards. So let's say the um, uh, the the agent might get stuck in some bad state, and so reinforcement learning is more challenging than other types of machine learning because we have to perform this kind of long term planning and lo long term exploration to make sure we're not stuck in any. Uh, in any bad states, uh, and also the decisions that led us to this good state may not be 
or if we make good decisions, we may only observe their good results farther out in the future, and this makes uh, learning the agent a little bit more difficult. It, ma it makes learning good policies for the agent more difficult. Finally, the last distinction I want to make in this video is uh, between two related fields of, uh, of, of uh, two related fields, which are artificial intelligence and deep learning. And uh, we often hear them in the same context as machine learning, but they are not quite the same. Uh, first of all, artificial intelligence is a general academic uh, and also applied field that is concerned with building systems which mimic human intelligent behavior. Um, so the ultimate goal of artificial intelligence, this is what this is also called general artificial intelligence or strong artificial intelligence, is to build entities that are that appear to be and that that behave as intelligently as humans. But there are also lots of sub goals towards that. Uh, for example, logical reasoning may be one of them, uh, or planning may be one may, may be another one. And machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence, which uh, consists in uh, building machines that can learn from experience. Um, so this is a feature of an intelligent system, but not the only one. For example, logic may be a property of an intelligent system that is not necessarily tied to learning, or logical reasoning may not be tied to learning. Um, and uh, but machine learning is nonetheless considered a very, very important tool towards building artificial intelligent systems, and it is, it is considered to be the most promising approach towards achieving that long-term goal. And then deep learning is a subset of machine learning which focuses on a particular type of model that is called uh, a neural network, which is loosely inspired by how the brain works. And uh, these kinds of models are uh, very successful today. They can solve a lot of important practical problems such as image recognition or speech recognition, machine translation. These are uh, tasks on which deep learning models have achieved really, really impressive results. And this is why deep learning is a particularly uh, interesting and exciting area of application today.